Welcome to my channel. This is today's episode of Daily News Clips. But before I get to that, I want to thank you for coming to my channel and for supporting me. I really do appreciate it. I have four items for today. The first one is titled, Left's War on Nuclear P Power Proves Disastrous for New York. This is an interesting article. At least it is to me. According to a new report, the forced closure of New York's Indian Point nuclear power plant in 2021 led to an 83% spike in electricity costs for residents, while also making the state even more reliant on fossil fuels and leading to an increase in greenhouse gas emissions. The saga has proved to be yet another stark warning about the consequences of the left's war on nuclear power and the failure of so-called green policies. A study out earlier this month from the Foundation for Research on Equal Opportunity found that the closure, quote, significantly increased the state's reliance on natural gas and affected electricity costs and reliability. Specifically, the median electricity price in the state spiked from 2470 per milliwatt hour to 4539 per milliwatt hour or an 83.77% increase. Well, I'll bet the New York residents are happy about that. Their electric bills are almost twice what they were. Moreover, if an Indian Point had remained operational, New York would have produced 8.03 fewer metric megatons of CO2 in 2022. 2022. <laughs> so, basically, by killing nuclear power, what they've done is jacked up their prices and jacked up their pollution. Does that make any sense to anyone? You know... I, myself, personally, I am pro, uh, what's the word I want to use? Uh, eco, I guess I'll call it. I'm eco pro, okay? Uh, I have spent a lot of money to insulate my house, to get better windows, to reduce my electricity costs, and also to reduce my pollution. Uh, I, I, I recycle plastics and paper which even my kids don't do, which I don't understand. Why don't my kids do that? I don't understand it. But anyway, I've done all of that because I believe that we should be good stewards of the planet. But there has to be some sense to it. There has to be some, some kind of a intelligent decision-making. And this obviously is not intelligent. But yet, if you read in the article, they fought for 15 years to get this plant closed. And they've now succeeded. And what have they done? <laughs> they've increased prices and increased pollution. I, I don't think that's what the goal was of this effort to get rid of the nuclear plant. But it certainly was the result, wasn't it? The second article I have is something that shocked me. You can see the title, Biden's FBI authorized the use of deadly force when necessary during the Mar-a-Lago raid. In other words, federal agents of the FBI were authorized to shoot, if necessary, a former president of the United States. In what world does that make any sense? In what world is that even permissible that just absolutely blows my mind I, I, I'm I'm shocked I'm absolutely shocked all right enough of that obviously I'll put all the links in the description so you have them available to you and the next thing I want to do is I want to uh, watch the next episode of Ben meets America and this time Ben is in uh, K Kentucky at the Kentucky Derby. This is a six minute video. I'm going to show you the whole thing. It, it, it's really interesting to me.
The Kentucky Derby is an American institution, which is probably why I was sent to it. It's such a good feeling to know you're alive. I'm off to the races. The Derby isn't just a horse race. It's a microcosm of America itself. And at the very top are the folks with trackside seating. Who here is crass enough to tell me how much these tickets cost? Anyone? Nope. No, no one will tell me? What advice do you have to people who want to be able to be where you are right now? Uh, work hard. Everyone here told me that if you work hard, anything is possible. Come on, Tommy! How much do you think you might win from this? Whatever I want, I'm going to donate to the Republican Party. <laughs> I grew up in a trailer park. Really? Do you think people who don't come from money and get rich are more likely to vote Republican <laughs> than people... <laughs> than other people? I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, like, I, I don't. I do think that um, when you don't come from really anything and then you you want to protect your assets, and I think that there's sometimes a political party who maybe leans more towards doing that than others. I was talking to this lady in the famed Millionaire's Row, where weekend tickets go for around $6,500. A little pork roast here, which I'm not optimistic for. Mm -hmm. No, a dry pork roast. Kind of not. Millionaire's Row? Is there a billionaire's row? Do you, do you gamble here? I do. Okay, you might have to show me how to do this. He wants to do a win play show yes. on the five horse. What's so great about number five? Five is my lucky number when it comes to races. Well, he's not lucky because he's scratched. He's oh, he's scratched? scratched. How about number seven? This seems awfully arbitrary. There you go. We are horse seven as well. Oh, yes. Come on, seven. Move your blooming horse. You get that reference? I got it. I got it. Hell of an audience here. Dang. I missed it by that you much. really blew it, Seven. With no winnings to my name, I continued my tumble down the derby hierarchy. We're going to head up to the rooftop of the starting gate suites. Now, these are around, I think, 3500 bucks for a weekend pass. Not quite millionaire's row, but, like, it'll do. Let's see what it's like. This is what I want you to know. Yes. The Kentucky Derby Museum have inducted us to the Hall of Fame. They're we, we actually sent. No. So they're turning you to wax? Uh, we don't know yet. We're not sure. Give them worry about class warfare. <laughs> what? No. Why? I just couldn't stop ruining this party. Do we need a substantial policy change to make it easier for more people to achieve their dream? Or is believe it all just it, about. Believe it, think it, it will happen. It's all believe it, think it, you will achieve it. 100%. Well, it's all... give it everything you got. You'll know, if the man in the mirror says I gave 110% and you say you did, but you really didn't, you're not going to get it. Do you agree with what he's saying? Absolutely. I agree 110%. I get paid to have fun. I love it. Like, just as, even if they're nasty. Even if they're nasty. I don't care because I have joy. What are you on? Coffee. All right, but surely you've got some coworkers around here who are like, I can't stand this, eat the rich raise these people's taxes. We're not going to talk about that. We're not? No. Why? That's interesting. No, 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 no. We're going to talk about my joy and how I love working here and how I want to progress. There was one place left to look for class resentment, the cheap seats. I'm in the infield now where tickets go for about $150. I've seen a drunk passed out in the grass, a man dressed as Hulk Hogan, and behind me a horde of 20-year-olds are lining up to buy something called Zinn. <laughs> I can see Millionaire's Row, but I've never felt so far away. How do you think the country's doing? So good. Um, USA is doing phenomenal. Doing like, phenomenal. absolutely. When are we not? We live in a blessing and people don't realize that, so yay! Well, do any of the people who don't realize it, like, do any of them have a point about anything? Here, here, here. Why are we focusing on the negative? Exactly. Is that the solution to America? Look at Just it, don't look focus at it. on the negative? Sunshine. Beautiful. Partly cloudy. Partly cloudy. <laughs> Do you know anyone who's not, uh, uh, who has any of the nicer seats, like a millionaire's row or anything? My parents. Do you feel like America is generally a fair place when it comes to being able to get ahead? I'd say so. You'd say so? I'd yeah. say so. I would yeah. say for the most part, absolutely, yeah. Some people think that, that, uh, that America is a place where not enough people have the opportunity to have a not a millionaire life, but a comfortable life. Do you they're think there's not, anything there? They're just not opening their eyes or putting themselves around the correct people. Is there a politician th th out there that you particularly admire right now? Uh, Kamala Harris. Do you think we have a, a wealth or income inequality problem in America? Yes, we do. But it turned out even the Democrats in this town were all about bootstraps. Create your own opportunity. Stop waiting for jobs. <sighs>
<clears throat> Hello. Hey. Okay. 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 Yeah, no. Nope. All right. Bye. <sighs> Kamala Harris! Do you think we have a, a wealth or income inequality problem in America? Yes, we do. But it turned out even the Democrats in this town were all about bootstraps. Create your own opportunities. Stop waiting for job opportunities. Create your own podcast. Create your own show. Create your own book. It wasn't until the main event, the actual Kentucky Derby, that I was distracted enough to stop pestering everyone. They say the Kentucky Derby is the most exciting two minutes in sports. Which may be true, but I was more interested in the drama of the aftermath. I got to watch the winning jockey's family as they heard the official results. Most of the prize money would go to the horse's owner, but the guy who rode the thing across the finish line would get 10%, which I later learned was around $300,000. Que ganan! Mucha, 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 mucha felicidad. Mucha. Okay, felicidad. Y dinero, cuánto dinero. Dinero, dinero felicidad. No, es no sé nada yo. La más Entonces, importante es la felicidad que gana mi caballo porque sure, yo yeah. trabajo para Pero, él todo el día. El dinero, el yeah. dinero es... For the first time that weekend, yeah. I wondered if I might be the one obsessed with wealth. Well, this was my first Kentucky Derby. And what did I learn about America? I tried to talk to people about wealth inequality, which, as it turns out, is a really fantastic topic at a party. No one feels as bad as liberals think they should, is one thing I have learned. And when you try and get them to feel bad, they don't like it. So good. Why is there? I really enjoy these episodes where he uh, talks to what I guess you could call a common man, although some of those people weren't common men. But he gets, I guess you could call it, the heartbeat of America. And I just enjoy that. I really do. The last item I have on my list is an interesting article written by a historian about the war in Israel. And I want to share this with you because he makes a number of points that I think are, are worth considering. First of all, he says, for those of you who have an actual, you know, life, a geographical clarification, there's Rafa in Egypt, Rafa in Gaza, and the Rafa border crossing. The crossing gets its name from the city. In the early 1980s, Egypt began the systematic destruction of the original city, the one in Egypt, for security purposes, and relocating the population further to the west. This allowed them to erect a formidable security barrier separating Egypt from Gaza. Now, I've asked this question before, but I'm going to ask it again. Why do none of the media and none of the politicians and nobody that I can think of ever ask 
Why does Egypt have this huge security barrier? And why do they keep the Palestinians out of Egypt? Don't you think that's a question worth asking? But here's the important part. As a result, Gaza and Rafah is right up against Egypt's barrier, and the crossing is in the southwestern part of the city. The border crossing isn't exactly in the middle of nowhere. It's actually in the city, since it supposedly it has or had 1.2 million inhabitants. It has a reasonably large footprint, and supposedly it's the last remaining stronghold of Hamas. Now, as you know, uh, the world, basically, has been telling uh, Israel not to go into Rafah. Uh, particularly because at this point, 800,000 people have either been evacuated or have fled Rafah. Since the population was supposedly only a little over 1 million, not many civilians are left. That figure, by the way, comes from the United Nations. A more recent figure from the IDF says it's closer to a million. But regardless, the conclusion is the same. Not many supposed civilians are left to massacre. At almost the same time, another branch of the UN abruptly reduced the civilian death toll in Gaza by about 50%. Now, early on, it was very clear that the Hamas-generated figures were largely fictional. But in the West, they were taken as true, and hence all the claims against Israel. So to wrap, and I'm jumping over paragraphs here, so if you, you know, you, you probably should read the whole article. So to wrap all this up, Washington is trying to get Israel not to conduct an operation that's already in progress in order to save casualties in a civilian population that's not actually there based on losses that never occurred. What a world we live in, huh? Whatever the response or absence of response is, it's hard not to see the pattern. Israel's told not to do X because of Y, which anyway won't work. Israel does X, which then turns out to work. Israel's then told not to do X, one, because of Y, one, and so on. Curiously, we've seen a surprisingly parallel pattern with regard to the Russia invasion of Ukraine. There, too, the supposed experts were all wrong, and there were the same attempts at restraint using the same claim. If Ukraine retaliated against Moscow by carrying the war into Russia proper, it would trigger a global conflict. Judging from what's going on all around us nowadays, it's the global basis for foreign policy. Denying reality seems sort of risky, but here we are. So the consequent distress that by defending itself after 7 October, Israel would trigger a dramatic response that would lead to a regional conflict was some kind of fantasy. Now, as everyone knows, when Iran did respond militarily, its massive aerial offensive against Israel was an abject and total failure. Although this failure appears to have been checked into the memory hole, along with the IDF response, that doesn't mean that they didn't happen but it's difficult for people to admit their key assumptions are wrong. So they either pretend they aren't, or they simply go into denial, act as though the events they, that proved they were wrong never happened. It, this stuff is, you know, I've been watching this all my life. Experts make statements about global powers like Russia, and they turn out to be completely false and the experts never are held to account for it. They're called back on the TV programs and they're asked to pontificate again. <laughs> and they're always wrong. It's unbelievable how much they are wrong. It's, it's like, you know, it's almost like, <laughs> I'm making fun, okay? It's almost like they have a narrative that they want to promote and they don't care about the facts. Wouldn't it be nice if we had some experts that actually looked at the facts and said, here's what we know, and here's what we may be able to assume. My other counter was speculative. Tehran had and still has a track record of announcing devastating new weapons that on close examination either aren't, don't work, or don't even exist. Again, the Russians have been doing that for a long time. So possibly Tehran decided Israel was doing the same thing. The reverse of the same fallacy the West made during the Cold War assuming that Soviet equipment was as good or better than that of the West. 
and we found that it wasn't. But from Tehran's point of view, it was ominous. In one coordinated operation, the IDF first destroyed Iran's ability to detect an aerial attack against the defense system protecting its most important military installation, the center of their nuclear weapons development, and then destroyed the actual defense installation itself. And isn't it interesting that no one says anything? It's like this stuff just kind of disappears and we talk about stuff that doesn't exist. It's, it's amazing to me. It's difficult to say how this will play out in Iran. The situation inside the country is volatile and hence unpredictable. But based on the pattern that's already established, whatever happens, the West, and particularly Washington, will can continue to be well behind the curve. Boy, isn't that the truth. Huh. And one last thing. Because they believe their own narrative, even when they should have suspected it was a lie of their own making. That's a quote from the article. And that's the point that I'm trying to get to. If we are going to go about believing experts, people who supposedly know what's going on, and yet they continually be proven to be wrong, why do we continue to believe them? Why do we continue to ask them for their opinions? Why don't we just reject them and say, you don't know what you're talking about? That's, to me, that makes sense. Does that not make sense to you? I, I don't understand it. I really don't. And yet, it's been this way my entire life. My entire life. All kinds of false narratives get started and get promoted and people believe them, and the experts believe them, and they, they pontificate about what's, what it's going to mean to us, and it's all based on falsehood. Absolute craziness. Well, you know, I always pray for you. I pray that you will live an abundant life, that you'll be healthy, that you'll live a long time, and that God will keep you safe from harm, and that you will be born again if you're not already. I pray for the same thing for every person that you love. And most of all, I pray that you will be anxious for nothing, but in all things, through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, you will make your requests known to God, and the peace that passes all understanding will keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. This is the Vietnam Era Vet, out.